Previously, we've learned that in order to show that a subset of a group is itself a group, that is a subgroup, it suffices to show that the subset is closed under multiplication, that it contains the identity, and that it contains all of the inverses uh, for elements in the set. It turns out that we can also rewrite that in a, yet another way, a potentially simpler, uh, a simpler way of doing it. In some regard, I kind of feel like this one's a little bit less intuitive, but in terms of checking, it's a shorter list. We're going to see that a subset H of G is in fact a subgroup of G if and only if H is non-empty and if the value G times H inverse belongs to H whenever G and H belong to H. So basically what we're trying to say here is a subset will be a subgroup if it's a non-empty subset and it's closed under division because uh, multiplying by H inverse is multiplying by the reciprocal there. So let's, it's an if and only a statement, right? So there's actually two things we have to do. So let's first argue that if H is a subgroup, it has these principles. Well, if H is a subgroup, it's not empty because it contains the identity. So there's something in there. And then if you take the elements G and H with inside of the subset H, then because it's a subgroup, it has inverses. So H inverse will be in there. And so since G and H inverse are in H, then their product will be in H. And as G and H were chosen arbitrarily, a subgroup will be closed under division because it's closed under multiplication and it's closed under inverses. So you saw the three, the three actions in play right there, right? Closed under inverses, closed under products, closed under the identity. That'll give you this. But it turns out this process is reversible. So suppose that H is non-empty. It contains something. We don't know what that is yet. And it's closed under division. So where can we go there? Well, since it's non-empty, there's something in there. Call it H. We don't know what that is necessarily, but we know H is in there. Well, because H is in there and it's closed under division, right? It'll contain the element H, H inverse. But H, H inverse is just the identity. Therefore, this set will contain the identity. Oh, that's great. But then what we're going to do is we're going to do the following game. Uh, so H is in there. E is in there, right? Uh, so that means because of this division property, it'll contain the element E H inverse. This will be inside of H as well, but this is just H inverse, all right? And so it, this set will be closed under inverses. It has the identity, and it'll also be closed under inverses. Oh, two down, one to go, right? We got to show it's closed under multiplication. Well, what we've now done here is we've now shown that it contains E, it'll contain H, it'll contain H inverse, necessarily right but in fact to do multiplication like the closure on the multiplication what we have to say is the following if g and h are inside of h so i'm going to stop you right here so like the, the the closure principle says if g and h are in h then g times h is in h now this is a conditional statement right it's if then right so there's something here and then something here when you prove a conditional statement one thing that that um, early proof writers sometimes struggle with is when you prove it when you prove an if and only if statement you do not have to prove the if part that is we don't have to show that there exists two distinct elements inside the set for all we know we have the trivial group which only contains the identity there might not be anything else in there you don't have to argue that there's multiple elements in there you don't all you have to do is you have to say if this happens then this happens. It could be that the if part is completely vacuous. There might be nothing that ever makes the if part true. Don't matter. In order to prove a conditional, you assume the if, and then you prove the then. So that's what we're going to do as well. So we're going to take two arbitrary elements of H. There might not even be any. We only know there's one element. They're not, there might not be a second element. And after all, when you say if G and H are in H, nowhere are we assuming that G and H necessarily are distinct. They could be the same element. Um, or even if we do assume they're different, what's the big deal, right? Uh, that's the if part, right? So take two elements, G and H, inside of H. Well, from what we've already shown, if G and H are in H, then that means H inverse will be in H. And then... Uh, there's a typo here. Someone's missing their G. Yikes. How embarrassing. Uh, because G and H is, is an H, a, G and H inverse will be an H. And therefore, G times H inverse inverse. 
since you'd closed under division, you, that'll be an H as well, but that's just the element GH itself. So we've now seen that our set here is closed under multiplication. And any set that's closed under multiplication, contains identities and contains inverses, is a subgroup like we've already proven. So this gives you another way of showing that a subgroup or that a subset could be a subgroup by showing it's not empty and closed under division. Because basically, if you're not empty, you have to contain the identity. And when you show something's not empty, you typically just show that the identity is in there. That's the easiest way to do it. And then showing that something's closed under division is basically showing it's closed under multiplication and inverses simultaneously. So I don't want you to think that it's like, oh, wow, it's such a short list comparatively. You basically have to show the same things. It's just you're kind of squishing two steps into one. And if that seems easy, by all means, do it. And that's going to bring us to the end of this lecture, uh, lecture 10. We'll talk some more about subgroups in the next, in the next uh, lecture, of course. Uh, take a look at that uh, coming up soon, and I'll see you later. Bye, everyone.